back to school and back to the work of making education better. This week on the Laura Flanders Show, it's that time of year. I'm joined by educators and education activists, Natasha Capers, Jose Luis Vilson, and Adam Sanchez to talk about educational justice, teaching in Trump times, and taking stock of the current state of public education. It's all coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. For many across this country, September means back to school. From teacher uprisings demanding fair wages to student uprisings demanding an end to gun violence, 2018 has felt like a year of upheaval when it comes to education and maybe even transformative change. As students, parents and teachers get back into the swing of the new school year, we're going to ask today how transformative change can happen in the classroom and why that is so pivotal. While the Trump administration's agenda seems still to be to weaken public schools with, among other things, yet more charters, more virtual schools, more profit making, what is the place for education activists who defend the principle but continue to push for change and justice within the public education system? To delve deeper into what all of this means, I am happy to welcome my next guests. Natasha Capers is the coordinator for the New York City Coalition for Educational Justice. Adam Sanchez is an educator, editor of Rethinking Schools, and an organizer with the Zinn Education Project. And Jose Luis Vilson is also an educator and the author of a book, This Is Not a Test, a new narrative on race, class, and education. He's executive director of EduColor, too. Thank you all for being here. You're Thank all you. busy people, particularly this time of year. 2018, who, who wants to lead off? Where do we find ourselves? How has it been? Uh, in the area of education. Good, bad, ugly. We've seen some amazing stuff. Who wants to start? Jose? Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Well um, 2018 has been really interesting. Uh -huh. um, interesting good? Interesting good, I would say. Um, because for me as an organizer, um, upheaval, you know, is, is good. It shows the will of the people, the power of the people, and really where are the lines in which people are not, are willing to just say, you know what, mm. we can't anymore. Mm. So we saw a lot of that this year from the teacher, teacher strikes across the country yeah. um, to student walkouts, New York City, other cities and other states, to even work that we've done in Coalition for Educational Justice with rallies and protests and pushing, taking over City Hall, mm. pushing the administration around culturally responsive education. Like, it's been a year of pushback from the people, um, and I think it will only continue. Mm. Adam, you want to add to that? Any lines in the sand worth raising up? Yeah, I mean, I, I also have a positive outlook for 2018 because I think the, the strikes we've seen, I mean, these statewide strikes, which are really unprecedented, um, have really transformed the conversation we've been having about schools, right? Um, before 2018, it was about testing and charters. Um, and I think these strikes have really transformed the conversation to be about funding, which in so many ways gets to a lot of the, the, the heart of the matter, um, the defunding of public education. Um, it, I think it's also been a brush of fresh air uh, for the labor movement as well. Um, and so I, you know, I think that this could possibly be a turning point. Um, we've seen you know, a really steady attack on public education for decades now um, and a slow building since the recession as that attack has intensified so has the fight back you know we saw it with um, teachers in Madison Wisconsin we saw it with the Chicago Teachers Union strike and now it's erupted on a different scale mm. and Jose it seems as if our schools and what's happening in them and around them is becoming part of the community I mean it, this is this kind of like a social justice model of of organizing, it's not just staying behind school boards. And it's about time. And you think about how 
we forever try to figure out what it means to be public. Mm. And there's been this whittling away of what it means to be public, what it means to be a democracy. And I think marginalized groups have always said, hey folks, look at what's going on over here, look at what's going on over there. And the general zeitgeist in America has always said, well, maybe not really because we still have hope in whatever we perceive as the American democracy. And now it's very much like, oh snap, there are people who don't actually believe in the things that we thought we believed in. So we need to actually discuss what it means to be America, what it means to be public, and how we can be more inclusive of all these marginalized groups who otherwise didn't have a voice in our most public of institutions. And it's given voice for folks like me to say, hey, let's educators, let's actually put ourselves in the game. It is no longer acceptable for us to be apolitical because it, we are a political agents. We are part of this work. Parents uh, have to be engaged. Community members need to be engaged. Students need to have a voice in this. I mean, our founding fathers, so to speak, were real young at the time when they were governing an average age of like 22 or 23, if I'm not mistaken. So these are things that are real prominent and it's good for us to have the conversation, but not only that, but then to take action mm. upon it. So let's define some terms. When we say educational justice, what do we really mean? Adam, you wanna start with that? Sure. I mean, for me, educational justice means uh, uh, redistributing resources, right? Um, from, you know, right now we have an educational system where, uh, like our society, the resources are concentrated at the top. Um, and, you know, if you look at where Bill Gates sends his kids to school, uh, right, it, it's a very different kind of education than where, you know, the majority of public school kids in this country go to um, and the education that they get uh, uh, day by day. And so for me, educational justice is a redistributive component. Um, and when you're redistributing, you have to talk about um, racism in this country, right, because the racism is built into um, the inequitable distribution of resources resources in this country. Um, so it's also uh, a racial redistribution mm. as well. And how has educational justice been affected under the Trump administration? With all the positivity we just said, notwithstanding, Betsy DeVos has been at it. Right. I mean, I, you know, I, I think uh, Bets, well, let's be clear, Betsy DeVos is not great. Uh, she's, you know, clearly a privatizer. She is, you know, um, but I, in some ways, I think, you know, Arne Duncan was in some ways more savvy about using the federal government um, to uh, be a hammer for education, right? In some ways, the Republicans kind of states rights issue has really kicked it. And Obama also, and towards the end of his administration, kicked it to the states as well with the new, um, the ESSA Act. Um, and so a lot of these battles we're seeing really, you know, DeVos is, is absent from them. They're happening on the state level, um, which, which is a good thing because I think anything she puts her foot into is gonna be bad for public education. So more continuity perhaps than change? Yeah. I will say that as much as you know, Bessie DeVos as, you know, head of federal department of education is problematic at best. Um, mm. What happens at the presidential level is even worse, right? Because um, rhetoric oftentimes have, has more of a negative effect than policy, right? So listening to this president talk about immigrants, Mexicans, um, black students is just as problematic as the policies, mm. right? So and listening to him talk about schools, I mean, he kicked off in his inaugural address talking, well, painting pictures of our public schools as if they were just sort of sites of slaughter. Yeah. Violence and crime. Right. And but then you learning anything. But you also have him talking about, well, you know, Mexicans are rapists and murderers and, you know, they should the wall. And then what happens is it trickles down. Right. But when we think about bullying, typically folks think about it as a mean kid picking on a weak kid. Mm -hmm. Really what it is, is that it's a microcosm of the bigger society. So when you see your president talk badly about an entire group of people, then that is what the messaging that children take in as well. So the effects have actual real time effects on how even students interact mm -hmm. with one another. You're, you're in the classroom, I mean, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? I think more than anything, you know, all these seats seem to have a, uh, a power, not just with policy, but also with the cultural zeitgeist, right? When uh, 
President Trump was elected, I remember so many of my kids, and you know, my kids are predominantly Dominican, but we, are, we also have Central and South American kids. I have Mexican kids, Ecuadorian kids. A lot of them came in with, in tears, a lot of them just on their cell phones, trying to contact their family members, making sure they're okay. Like, uh, they, they started to get knowledgeable about what it means to be, uh, I guess, an illegal immigrant and all this other uh, very controversial and downright dehumanizing language. Mm -hmm. So when, I, when I'm in the classroom, it's very much about affirming their own identities and making sure that they're included in the space because I recognize that as a teacher, I'm not just representing myself as Jose Wilson, I'm representing an agent of the state, right? And I think that's a crucial element to the work that we do as public school teachers is saying, yes, we may represent a larger entity than ourselves, mm -hmm. but we also have to transmute the, and yeah. transmit the, the conversation and talk more deeply about what it means to be American in this country. And then if we're not satisfied with that definition, we need to be able to move it forward. So over the summer, a lot of kids might have been seeing on their vacation the pictures of the separated families and those kids with hoods coming into their neighborhood detention centers. What were they making of all that? Any sense? It's, it's, they're, they're scared. Yeah. They're scared. They're downright scared. And a lot of them have reached out to me. They'll say, what's going to happen here? What's going to happen with my dad? What's going to happen with my yeah. uncle? Um, any number of things. And, you know, even when you have a, a governor that pr pronounces himself to be democratic, like a Governor Cuomo, right? Like, there's only so much he can do mm -hmm. if, he's, if we don't do things like, for instance, abolish ICE, or we don't, like, make strong policy. And then not to mention, have communities themselves come together and say, this is not acceptable, this is not tolerable, and we need to be able to push back in a real strong so way. So we've heard the word cultural a few times. Let's talk about culturally responsive education and what it actually is and why it's so important, why it's so pivotal. So for us at CJ, culturally responsive education is so much more than just one or two things. Like it's so much more than the heroes and holidays. So we can celebrate, you know, um, Cinco de Mayo and Juneteenth. And it's like, first of all, y'all don't even celebrate those things properly. Because so. <laughs> mm. um, one of them really like... So it's like, but what it really is, is a holistic of way of viewing children, respecting children, their families, and teaching in an honest and responsible way. So when I say that, it's about, one, decolonizing our own thoughts and practices as parents, students, and educators. Um, who am I in this role? How am I teaching? How am I, as an agent of the state, what am I projecting, mm. right? And how do I stop my own thoughts projecting on those students, right? How do I value the cultural backgrounds, um, languages, traditions of the students who are in my classroom and their families? And then also zeroing in on um, curriculum that is truthful, because so much of our, of our curriculum, especially social studies, is actually not truthful. Um, that is truthful, but also honors them. So how do you do that? I mean, Adam, there's probably, there are a lot of new teachers going into the classrooms right about now. Maybe they've been there for a few weeks, so many of them go in with a lot of aspirations and, and, and confidence and belief that they're going to be able to make a difference in these kids' lives. And then they're suddenly in a world of tests and, and, and you know, teacher's notes and dealing with schedules and rules and, and a curriculum that they haven't really had any role in, then they might be alone in their school that's fighting cuts. I mean, I could go on. How do we help, how do we, the community, help that teacher that, that might be feeling pretty lonely right about now? Right. Well, I mean, I think the first thing, you know, for teachers is we've got to break we've got to find allies, right? Whether that's, you know, it might not be, if, it's, if you don't have teachers in your school who you feel like it could be allies, maybe it's teachers within your city, maybe it's parents, right? Um, you, you have to find allies to be able to survive as, okay. a, as a teacher in, in, the, um, in this system. Do, um, I, hear, do I hear union? <laughs> right, or hopefully your union, right, in some places, um, is, should be doing that work and, and helping teachers um, find allies. But I think also it's about directly addressing uh, the issues that are really important in your students' lives. So one thing that, you know, that I know, you know about what Jose was just saying of teachers coming back into the classroom this September, we have to address these separations of families, right? right? These are things that our, our students are already talking about, that are already being affected by, um, and we have to teach it, right? And so uh, amongst you know, the conversations I'm having with teachers um, and I've had over the summer 
are, are how do we address this yeah. in the classroom and how do we front load it and start it in a way that says, look, we value your lives. We value, you know, we think you can really uh, be an agent of change in some of this. And so let's discuss what's going on in our country. Right and can now. you do that if, I mean, what if you're in a school that isn't up for that, that, that you don't have, you know, institutional buy-in, Jose? I, I think for me, it, it does start with the classroom and the experiences Just that students have. Uh, you, you must, you must. I, you know, the one question I have as a math teacher is, how do I get my students to see themselves as mathematicians? Mm -hmm. And that's really what it is. And I think about folks like Bado Freire, but I also think about uh, Bob Moses, who was an organizer in the civil rights movement, but then he comes and says, I gotta rethink the way we do math in this mm -hmm. country. And too much of our conversation around social justice is like, we gotta do social justice to children mm -hmm. and not right. with them and pull them in. So you mentioned Paulo Freire, the, the pedagogy of the oppressed. What do you pull from that? More than anything, it's really about trying to get, trying to build students up so that they have enough self-confidence to say, I am a, I'm a mathematician and I can do this in the ways that I do it. I, and for me in my classroom, as long as it's complete, consistent and correct, then I'm good. So if they have multiple ways of approaching this math, then I'm happy, mm -hmm. right? And people say, well, you gotta do a social justice project here and do it there, great. Fine, bring it all in. And you know, there are definitely a billion resources out there, but really it's about getting students to see themselves as competent and, um, and human mathematicians in the work that they're doing. And the teachers too. I mean, let's talk about what New York City has done recently. $23 million to give teachers new sorts of training around bias, around cultural responsiveness. Yep. What form does that take and what is that like for teachers? So for over a year, Coalition for Educational Justice have been fighting, organizing, and advocating yes. for this to happen, even to the point where having to take over City Hall at one point, right? Especially when in February you have a white teacher in the Bronx who steps on the backs mm -hmm. of a black female student to teach about slavery, and which is about absolutely, here. <laughs> literally, right. which is unnecessary, right? And so we're really happy to see is that's the first step. It's happening in three parts. One, in um, uh, 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 leaders from across the city, um, that being superintendents, principals, and field support staff, um, getting together and have a two-day training. There's um, work happening with folks who have become trainers to help spread this work and give support to schools. Um, they are having four-day trainings. And do these and trainings work? I mean, some people go through anti-bias training and it's like a multiple choice test mm. on a computer. Yeah. And then, well, and then teachers, sadly, are getting one-day trainings and implicit bias, right? And so the research shows that when they're done well, their work. CJ has always advocated for anti-bias training that is deep and ongoing and connected mm. to pedagogy or your role in that school community. Whether it's you are an administrator, if you are the lunch woman, whatever it is, it has to be connected. And that is the missing piece at the moment, mm. is that it has to be deep and ongoing. I can't just go, and I can't go to an anti-bias training and be like, okay, well, teach me everything about not being racist today. <laughs> Before four o'clock, right? Before four o'clock. Because if we could like undo systemic racism and one, eight hour sessions, I think we would have done it by now. <laughs> well, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, <laughs> I really want to Go follow ahead. up with that too because it also connects to the issue of teachers of color in New York City and the decimation of our profession. So, so too often I find that teachers of color are in the lowest third, I guess, poverty. So you have poor, medium, rich, right? And you know, our schools right now, our poorer schools have about 50% white and the non-color staff. But then as the schools get richer, they get whiter and whiter in their staff. And it's not to say that folks who are white can't be conscious about this work, it's, but it's very much, it seems to me that, you know, we have an issue where the people want to do this work. We're at the highest rate of folks, you know, of people of color coming into our profession, but then they also leave. And it's not just because of pay, it's because of the way that they feel in the schools. Like they're the only one who are doing the social mm. justice work. And if those folks, those folks who are out there who are actually trying to do this critical conscious work, um, they need to be thanked more often because yeah. often they're on an island in a very big way. Mm. And often they tend to be the marginalized folk who recognize it immediately, our Muslim uh, teachers, our uh, Filipino teachers, our, t our black teachers, obviously. Like it, it just spans the, the, the yeah. spectrum. So those are conversations that need to be had and the right people need to be in there and supported well. So a couple of questions. Are students and parents involved in any of this trying? Training? Currently, we are 
in communications with the Department of Education around the trainings. The trainings have started, but there has to be more work done on the part of the city. The mayor has to take responsibility. This lies solely on the mayor. He wanted to have mayoral control. He continues to fight for mayoral control. He has mayoral control. So take the control, mm -hmm. right? Really say that as a city, we prioritize making sure that our teachers are trained to the best of our abilities to take this on. Mm. And we will accept nothing else. And then also create the right environment so that we can start to do the, the work around curriculum. The fact that we're talking about family separation, that has a historical context, right? Slavery. Native American um, boarding schools, um, Japanese internment camps, that has a historical context. How are teachers gonna go in and really set that up and be able to talk about those big concepts, the topics, and dig in without stepping on the backs of students once again? Changing the curriculum would be a part of it. I want to bring in some other people when we're talking about the we on this program we often talk a lot about um, the commons and the idea of the commons or we talk about it some you talk about it in your work education being part of the commons public education specifically can you just give us that lens on these stories just a little bit right I mean I think what what the kind of corporate education reform is moving towards is really you know looking at education as a commodity yeah. right is that that can be you know bought and sold by by consumers right and looking at students and parents as consumers right um, and and what you lose when you view education like that um, is the the transformative possibility of public education for developing active citizens were you right? transformed in school do you feel I absolutely I was transformed in school. I mean, I you know, I some people have negative, uh, you know, uh, experiences in public education. I had a very positive experience in public education. Um, I had some, you know, teachers that I feel like really helped um, me come to political consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, and, you, and, and that was really, you know, helpful in terms of my <laughs> development. Yeah. Same. I mean, but I also went to school at a time in District 23. I'm from Brownsville, Brooklyn. Still am. Children live there now, go to school there. Um, where I saw myself in everything, right? My teachers were black. If They, they were black American. They were Caribbean. They were Afro-Latinas. They were Hispanic. They ran the gamut, right? So, And I saw myself in the te in teachers, I saw myself in staff, I saw myself in administration, and so all the way even up into high school, and I saw who I can, like if I was like, if I'm gonna become a teacher, I could actually not just see myself as being the art teacher, mm -hmm. or the music teacher, or the gym, te right? I'm like, oh, I can do any of these things. Miss King does that. Miss mm -hmm. King teaches, you know, all of the globals. I can do that. Is there a teacher you wanna sh shout out to, Jose? Gosh, I mean, how, how many? You know, um, I had this this teacher, Mr. Connolly, in eighth grade, and it's interesting because Mr. Connolly, um, like he he was a young Irish guy, came from uh, Boston. He had just graduated, and he came to a a, a low, you know, a, a very low income school. But the he, the things he taught me about not just uh, English and language arts, but also about how to speak in front of someone, how to be uh, unafraid to get up and speak my truth. I mean, those are things that are real powerful. All right, so shout outs to teacher. I'll shout out to Flora McDonald, who was red baited out of the United States in the mm -hmm. 50s, came to the UK and was one of my most influential teachers. Thank you all, and thank you if you're teaching right now or going off into the schools, thank you for your work, and thank you, all of you, for, for coming in. This was a great conversation. Thanks for having me. Thank we'll you. have it again soon, I hope, more. All right, you're watching The Laura Flanders Show. You can get more information at our website, and if you prefer to listen, maybe while you're on your way to school, uh, you can sign up for our podcast at the website and get that podcast coming to you every week, along with all sorts of web-only, podcast-only extras and my weekly commentaries. Check it out at lauraflanders.org, and thanks.